If you are what you eat, and our food chain increasingly includes plastics, what does that make us? With us now on why that's a real and growing issue for our health, we welcome, in Utrecht, Netherlands, Juliette Legler. She's a professor of toxicology at Utrecht University. In Piscataway, New Jersey, Phoebe Stapleton, assistant professor of pharmacology and toxicology at Rutgers University. And here in our studio, Rick Smith, president of the Canadian Climate Institute and co-author of Slow Death by Rubber Duck, The Secret Danger of Everyday Things, which is a great title for a book. And Rick, it's great to have you back here in our studio and to our guests in Points Beyond. Thank you for joining us as well. I want to read this um, quote here from Nautilus magazine from last May to get us started here and set up the discussion to come. Sheldon, the graphic, if you would. Microplastics have been found in places as remote as Antarctica and the summit of Mount Everest, in fish guts and in honeybees. Researchers recently found tiny plastic particles in the lungs of surgical patients, the blood of donors, and the placentas of unborn babies. According to one study, people may be eating as much as a credit card's worth of plastic each week. Okay, Rick, get us started here. I'm sure people have seen the pictures on the news, for example, of yeah. these huge scows of uh, plastics in the oceans and that kind of thing, a garbage island in the Pacific. But how big is the problem of plastic that's actually too tiny for us even to see? Well, I mean, it's a huge problem and it's getting worse. And, and you know, as you point out, this, this, I think people have seen news coverage of sea turtles uh, being threatened by the plastic in the oceans, you know, very visible problems. But it turns out when it comes to human health, when it comes to uh, the toxicology of plastics, it's what we can't see that's turning out to be the real problem. So in the last few years, scientists have found that uh, when plastic gets into the environment, uh, it never really breaks down. Mm -hmm. It just, you know, sunlight will, uh, will break it into smaller pieces. The action of waves will break it into smaller pieces. It gets down to a microscopic size and then it starts to circulate in the ecosystem. And guess what? It, it turns out that it accumulates uh, in us, in okay. our bodies. Phoebe, follow up on that if you would. And if you can, just sort of take us through a typical day. How do these microplastics actually make their way into our bodies? Yes, Rick is absolutely right. They get broken down into these smaller and smaller pieces. Those pieces are of the size that can be ingested, whether that's through food products, uh, either things that the animal has eaten prior or the packaging and the processing of the food, of the water that we drink, both tapped and bottled, it's been found there, and then also in the air. So we can be breathing these particles into our lungs. And the size of those particles really makes an impact on where they go in the lungs and also where they go in our GI system after we ingest them. Juliet, can I just understand that a little better? Are you saying every time we take a swig of water, for example, out of a plastic bottle, we are ingesting not just the water, but some very, very tiny bits of plastic as well? Well, there is certainly a very good chance of that. Yes, there have been microplastics found in water and in food. Uh, the question is, of course, you know, there's also, you know, could be other things in our water as well, including chemicals uh, or other contaminants. But the question is, is that harmful to our body? And that's, of course, where, where our research comes in. You know, once we ingest these plastic particles, where do they go in our body or do, are they excreted? And will they cause harm there? And, and that's something we really don't know very well yet and something that uh, a lot of research is being undertaken at the moment to figure out. Those are key questions, but I'm not going to get to those just yet. I want to develop the tension of the narrative a little more because Rick did an experiment on himself. Yep. And I'd like you to give us some of the details around that. Why did you do this and what did you do? Well, about, about 13 years ago, uh, Bruce Laurie and I wrote a book called Slow Death by Rubber Duck, where we, we tried to get at this notion of uh, chemicals and consumer products. So quite often when people think about pollution, they think about big belching smokestacks, they think about uh, water pollution. You know, it turns out these days that, uh, that uh, most endocrine disrupting chemicals, hormonally disrupting chemicals, most carcinogenic chemicals that people come in contact with every day are, uh, come from the consumer products we use every day. So Bruce and I over the years have, have tested ourselves uh, to see to what extent these chemicals will accumulate in our bodies. And a couple of years ago in the Globe and Mail, um, I did this with microplastics. So I, I wanted to see, you know, how easy is it, is it uh, just living your daily life? So you didn't do anything different or special? Um, a six day experiment. First two days I just lived my life normally. Mm -hmm. um, I took a stool sample every day. 
Um, uh, my wife uh, found this all kind of charming, extremely <laughs> off-putting. Uh, but uh, in the last four days of the experiment, I actually tried to crank up uh, my level. Anything I ate, I made sure it came uh, wrapped in plastic. I only drank bottled water for the last four days. Uh, I left my food out on the table so that uh, household dust, which is mostly microplastics these days, mm. could uh, accumulate on the food. And what, what we found is that uh, in the last few days of the experiment, my microplastics levels did, uh, did increase. Is that to suggest that if you went in the opposite direction, avoided plastic <clears throat> to the best of your knowledge altogether, you could get the, uh, the amount of plastics in your system to zero? Um, almost certainly you couldn't get it to zero because, you know, I'm just looking around the studio here or any building, you know, most household dust in the corner of a room would be microplastics these days. You know, it's in the air that we breathe. Couldn't get it to zero, but, but almost certainly you could reduce it uh, if you, uh, if you tried to eliminate as much plastic as possible from your life. Phoebe, apparently last spring there were two studies that came out in the UK and in Netherlands showing microplastics deep inside the lungs of surgical patients, of all things, and in the blood of anonymous donors. Now, how important would you say those studies are for our understanding of microplastics and how they move around? I think those studies are vitally important. They are the first studies to really identify that they are indeed in human tissues. So scientists have been saying that it's likely for a long time, but these were the studies to really identify that they're there. Uh, the one in the human lung patients, especially because it used a special type of microscopy to be able to really visualize these particles and identify what they were. Uh, the one in the bloodstream was a little bit different. It used a chemical analysis to be able to identify them, but it was really some of the first early proof, along with the other study that you referenced, looking at human placenta, that these particles really are inside human bodies. And Juliet, let's circle back to the questions that you were asking earlier, namely the most important one. Do we yet know with any certainty how much damage this is doing to our health? No, I'm afraid we don't. Uh, good news is that there is a lot of research ongoing to try to figure that out. So certainly here in, in Europe, uh, the European Commission has invested uh, millions of euros to, into research into microplastics and human health. And I know that other countries all over the world are, are following. So researchers like myself and, and Phoebe and others are, are looking at, so what happens once these plastic particles get into our lungs and get into our system? Can we study how they affect um, human cells in, in different laboratory situations? So moving away from the studies with animals into real human cellular models, you know, looking at how these chemicals are taken, these plastics are taken up, what shape and size is really important when it comes to uptake of the of the plastics, and then what are the biological effects involved uh, once we look in, into these cellular experiments? And a quick follow-up from our own lab. Oh, sorry, forgive, go ahead. Forgive me. Yeah. Quick follow-up, but is it possible that is it possible this isn't doing damage to us at all? It's possible. Uh, it's possible that the, that these plastic particles are rather inert. Uh, I personally think that uh, from our, our initial. Bi uh, biological studies that we've already seen changes in gene expression and these are these in our cells for example in the placenta cells that we s we're testing in the lab is already an indication that there are biological responses ongoing in the cell w whether or not those those responses will end up in a long-term adverse effect is, is too early to say but the first initial uh, evidence we definitely can see a biological response which you might consider to be considerable to, to be um, comparable to a small, another kind of small particle, like a, like a soot particle from air pollution. Hmm. Rick. I mean, I think I, I was going to go where, where Julia just, uh, just mentioned there. That, uh, so sure, some of the science around microplastics is recent, hmm. but here's two things we know about microplastics, and, and both of them are disturbing. Uh, the first is that the, the chemicals in plastic, we know a lot about them. We know that they have, in many cases, a carcinogenic effect. We know that they have a hormonally disruptive effect. When they get in our bodies, they mimic estrogen. Um, and so that we, there's been umpteen studies over decades on the negative biological effects of the chemicals in plastic. The second thing we know uh, that Juliet just mentioned, uh, going right back to the Industrial Revolution, uh, we know that bad things happen when humans breathe in small particles. 
lots of studies on, on women uh, during the Industrial Revolution uh, working in big factories, breathing in fibers uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the garment industry. We know what happens when uh, miners breathe in coal particles. We know what happens when miners breathe in asbestos particles. No good comes from any of Bad this. Bad things yeah. happen uh, in terms of the inflammatory effect. Uh, so as, as Phoebe just mentioned, we now know that these particles are in, likely, the lungs of everybody on Earth. Uh, uh, it, it, is, it is, I think, inconceivable that that turns out to be good news. Phoebe, can I get you on that as well? Is it, is it possible that while this stuff gets inside us, it may not do any long-lasting damage to us? I agree with what Juliet said. It's still, I mean, we're both scientists. It's still kind of early on. So I can say that, as Rick is indicating, there are plastic places that I don't want a plastic particle to be. So what those uh, plastic are doing there in that what the cellular interactions are, if that's leading to some of the negative toxicological effects, uh, it looks like it likely is from a variety of different ways, both as Juliet was indicating through some DNA changes that we're seeing, as Rick is indicating through some endocrine disruption. I think those are all really good places to start, uh, as well as both the lung inflammation and just overall system inflammation. We know that when particles are places that they shouldn't be, as Rick is indicating, that they're doing things we don't want them to do. And now the question is, what are plastics doing when, we're the, when they are there? And what are the different types of plastics doing? Are those different outcomes? And let me do a follow-up with you, Phoebe. You studied microplastics in pregnant rats. What did you find? We did. We studied something even smaller called nanoplastic that we haven't touched on yet during this conversation. And that's a plastic that's um, about a thousand times smaller than a microplastic. So this is definitely something that we can't see. Unlike a microplastic, it's barely within the visible range. And what we found when we put these nano-sized plastics into our pregnant rat model, we not only were able to find them in the placenta of the rat mothers, but we were also able to find them excuse me, in the fetal tissues after a single exposure, and that was into the mother's lungs, and that was 24 hours after exposure, we started to look for them in those fetal tissues. And we ended up finding these plastic particles in the rat brain, liver, heart, kidney, lung, places we definitely don't want them to be. Can you make, Juliet, any conclusions about what this might mean for pregnant women? Oh, I'm afraid it's very early days uh, for that, and I, I certainly don't want to alarm pregnant women uh, um, at this time. What we are doing in, in, in our lab, in, in our uh, studies, is we're, we're doing large-scale epidemiological studies in which we're recruiting pregnant women um, to, to, in order to get samples from their um, from their placenta at, at delivery, and we'll be able to follow up the health of their kids. and. And only when we do those kinds of long-term studies will we be able to, um, to really be able to say with, with more certainty that, that there is indeed a health risk. In the meantime, that, of course, doesn't mean you can't uh, reduce your plastic exposure as much as possible. And, and what's really important uh, in, in all of the projects I'm involved in is that we have uh, government policymakers on board who are thinking about how can we assess the risk of these microplastics. They're such a really complex mixture of contaminants. Uh, it's not just one type of, of dust particle. It's a, it's a really complex group of contaminants of many different kinds of plastics, many different kinds of shapes and sizes and colors full of different kinds of chemicals. So re really complex when it comes to the policies we need to make there. But I also would like to say it's really important that um, we have in some of our research, uh, you know, some of the plastic manufacturers on board who are looking for ways to you know, produce better plastics, reduce the use of plastics, better understand how microplastics are formed from their products. And that's all uh, really important work to think about solutions to this huge problem. We certainly will come back to the issue of solutions and what we can do to change our behavior, change public policy. But before we get there, I want to talk to you, Rick, about the brain. Microplastics in the brain, what have you learned? Well, I mean, Phoebe's actually done some of this groundbreaking research, and what and what, uh, uh, what she has found, and she should wait in here. I don't want to put uh, words in her mouth, but uh, uh, as as uh, rat moms breathe in these particles, they then wind up in their fetuses, wind up in the in the brain compartment of those fetuses before the blood-brain barrier 
in that critical moment of uh, development that, that occurs in mammals, mm -hmm. rats and people and others, uh, uh, where uh, blood circulates in the body before that blood-brain barrier solidifies. Uh, and so these, these particles get locked into the brain. Um, and uh, so in, in some of the, uh, uh, Phoebe, you should wait in here, but in, in some of our discussions, I mean, you've, uh, you've wondered about a link to Alzheimer's hmm. as Phoebe, one example. you want to pick up on that, Phoebe? Sure. Uh, there, there are some concerns. It's that the plastics are places that we didn't think we would find them because of those barriers. I didn't think that they would get past the placental barrier, and I certainly didn't think that we would find them in these tissues. Now, that's not to say that they're directly um, in competition or directly in some type of, you know, next to a brain cell, they may still be in the vasculature of the brain. And these are some studies that we still have ongoing is exactly where they are and therefore what they're coming in contact with and therefore what kind of toxicology there may be. But I do know that we talk about dosage and the dose of these particles and how many we're finding in the brain is very, very low in comparison to how many we originally put in. But I know they're in an area that we don't want to be finding them as well. So it really begets more what if studies and what we're gonna be able to find from finding them there originally. But a lot more work is left to be done if they do have links to some of these neurological conditions that have increased in numbers as time has gone on. Juliet, I want to quote uh, a colleague of yours. Uh, you're going to help me with pronunciation on his last name. Dick Vetak, is that how he says it? Yep, very close, Vetak. Okay, very good. Ecotoxicologist, part of the research team that discovered microplastics in the blood, and he asks the following questions. Where's it going in your body? Can it be eliminated, excreted, or is it retained in certain organs, accumulating, maybe, or is it even able to pass the blood-brain barrier? Okay, today we don't know the answers to these questions you tell us, but how long do you think we're going to have to wait before we will know with certainty how to answer these questions? Well, not, not very long, I think. Uh, so, as I mentioned, a lot of research ongoing uh, in Europe and around the world. Uh, in, in projects that I'm coordinating, uh, we're looking at uh, human blood-brain barrier models. So we could be able to predict uh, the uptake, but not only of of one type of plastic particles, but of many different kinds of plastic particles. Uh, in addition, we're looking at uptake through the GI tract, uh, through the placenta. So there's a lot of research ongoing. I think in the next five years, we are going to have a lot of answers to these really, really important questions. Uh, in the meantime, Rick, the standard pushback against people who are yeah. making the argument that you are making, for example, is that, number one, we don't know with certainty today that this is doing any harm to people or, or their offspring. Uh, number two, the burden of proof ought to be on you that it is, in fact, doing yeah. some damage. Yeah. What's your response to that? I mean, let, let, let's, just, let's just reflect on the bonkers thing about this debate, which is that we're having a calm discussion here today about the fact that humans are suffused with tiny plastic particles that babies are being born pre-polluted. I mean, there was a study just in the last couple of weeks showing plastic particles in a human breast milk. I mean, it's, it's, it's inconceivable. Uh, and so the notion that the plastic industry advances, that you know, none of us should be terribly concerned because there aren't any bodies in the streets that can be pinned on plastics pollution uh, is nonsensical. Uh, so the, the, for starters, 40% of all the plastics produced are for single-use items. Plastic straws, plastic cup lids, uh, uh, crummy plastic packaging on, on vegetables in the grocery store, stuff that could easily be eliminated. So rather than, rather than uh, you know, the onus being on consumers, being on governments to wait for the evidence to take any action, uh, uh, we need to reverse that. And we need to start asking, wait a minute, wait a minute. How do we start reducing the amount of plastic in the environment? How do we start reducing the amount of plastic in you and me and our kids? Uh, okay, while we're, while we're also trying to pin down some of these scientific questions. Mm -hmm. but, but the lack of certainty is not an excuse for inaction. The lack of certainty should be a driver of concern and, and uh, an immediate regulatory and corporate action. Are you having these conversations with people in the plastics in industry these days? Um, there's lots of conversations going on. Unf unfortunately, here in, here in Canada, 
I mean, uh, Juliet uh, is, is in Europe, where Euro European governments are moving much more aggressively than North American governments. Here, here in Canada, the federal government, to its credit, is trying to get rid of a few, like a half dozen, uh, uh, disposable plastic items uh, that can be easily replaced by, by other materials. Well, straw, uh, the, straws the are pretty much gone now, aren't they? Getting there. Yeah. Um, uh, but the plastics industry is actually taking the federal government to court. The government of Alberta is actually taking the federal government to court. Uh, and I have a very hard time believing that Canadians would find those reasonable actions. I mean, yeah. Let me find out from Juliet. What's happening in Europe on this front, Juliet? Well, uh, in Europe at the moment, there's a, a, um, a regulation ongoing that will should be passed soon to, to completely restrict the use of in, <laughs> uh, intentional microplastic use in cosmetic products. So at least the first... Uh, the first step is being taken to reduce uh, and restrict the use of these plastics that are used intentionally. Uh, and what, what also is going on is, is that uh, chemical industry is involved in research, uh, developing their own projects and working together with academic partners to, uh, to work towards um, better replacement, uh, better recycling, uh, and looking at... Uh, which plastics should are really the worst when it comes to potential human health effects, and those are the ones to start with. Hmm. Phoebe, let me read this from Albert Rizzo, who's the American Lung Association's chief medical officer, who compared microplastics to the effort to convince governments that uh, maybe they ought to cut down on, or try to convince people not to smoke. Same kind of campaign. And Albert Rizzo says, by the time we got enough evidence to lead to policy change, the cat was out of the bag. I can see plastics being the same thing. Will we find out in 40 years that microplastics in the lungs led to premature aging of the lung or to emphysema? We don't know that. In the meantime, can we make plastics safer? Okay, that's the question for you, Phoebe. Can they make plastics safer in the meantime? I think it's exactly what Rick was identifying, that there, you know, there's this back and forth of we haven't found something, so we're not understanding what it is we're making them safer for. And I think in the plastics industry, there's been a lot of cat and mouse. For example, there are many products that are now BPA free, and that's great. But the chemical companies have transitioned BPA to some other chemicals instead. Those same plastics instead of BPA might have a BPF or a BPS in them. So they're just changing the chemical construct of something that we knew was unsafe. And that's concerning because it is this cat and mouse game. So instead of that greater good understanding of can't, is it something that, you know, we can transition, uh, make some changes to, I think they would argue that they don't know what they're changing for, or what they're changing against, uh, because those toxicological studies aren't firm. As Rick said, there aren't bodies in the ground that can be directly related to plastics. Well, okay, Rick, let me uh, do the, this follow-up. Uh, even at a certain point, the yeah. smoking industry this, uh, understood that it was dealing with a harmful product. Took a long time. Took a long time. Uh, if you ask people in the oil and gas sector today, they will acknowledge that they're contributing to climate change. And, you know, we can argue about how, how much time we've yeah. got to, to deal with that. Are there people in the plastics manufacturing business today that yeah. acknowledge this is happening and something needs doing? Yeah. Um, in, in my day job, I work at the Canadian Climate Institute, so I think a lot about the difference uh, in, in the trajectory of these different pollution issues, right? Uh, and with climate change, you know, yes, there's lots of challenges. Yes, there's lots of work to do. But, but the, the oil and gas industry is at the point, by and large, of buying into the concept of net zero. By 2050, uh, we gotta, we got we to eliminate uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. There, there's broad consensus on that. We are nowhere near that point when it comes to this plastics debate. If, if, if the plastics industry gets its way, uh, we're going to see a doubling of plastic production by 2040. Um, and here's a, here's a crazy statistic. The, uh, the acceleration of plastic production and use has been so rapid, even in the last 10 years, that half of all plastic made and consumed in human history has occurred in the last 15 years or so. Hmm. Uh, and the plastics industry harbors the ambition of doubling that again over the next decade. So the, the, the first thing we need to do with this plastics uh, uh, question, if we want to get it out of our bodies, protect our kids, is start cutting back on the unnecessary use of plastic. There's lots of good uses of plastic, uh, of things that make our lives better. Probably half of the plastic produced uh, goes into 
things that could easily be made out of other things. In which case, is it ultimately up to consumers to lead a charge on this? We're starting to see this already. I mean, there's, there's a triangular relationship between consumer preference and consumer pressure, regulatory action by governments, and then the response of, of companies. And we're already seeing uh, with, uh, with chemicals, Phoebe mentioned BPA, phthalates, uh, uh, some of these other plasticizing chemicals. Uh, young parents especially know to look for these when they shop. So we're starting to see uh, corp uh, manufacturers respond. Uh, and what we need to see is improved regulatory action uh, quickly. I'm going to ask our director for a three shot so I can say thank you to all three of my guests. There's Rick Smith on the left, president, Can Canadian Climate Institute. Phoebe Stapleton in the middle from Piscataway, New Jersey. She's a professor at Rutgers University. And Juliet Legler, professor of toxicology at Utrecht University, who came to us from the Netherlands tonight. My thanks to all three of you for joining us here on TVO. Much appreciated. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks for having us. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.